Hello friends. I'm so delighted that you have ordered this video and it is now in your possession because there's so many questions that are troubling all the North American people. They just don't know why things are happening as they are in our country. And Jack has put together some very, very interesting information on this video for you that will answer your questions. And so we've entitled it, Attack on Christian America, the United Nations Threat to Your Beliefs. We trust that as you study this video, all those questions that are troubling you right now will be answered and help you to be enlightened. And, you know, I want to thank you, Jack, for all the time you put in to put this together. Such great information for all of us. Well, I'm not only a student of God's Holy Bible, but I'm a student of history. Ladies and gentlemen, we are really in trouble here in America, especially as Christians. Our faith is being threatened. God only knows how much time we have left before the rapture. And if there'll be some persecution before we're called home, you can see the enemy in every area of our life. I've never known a time like this, and I've been in God's work for over 63 years. There was a time when there was such love, joy, and peace within Christendom. And today the enemy is ready to tear us apart. The old devil is a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5.8 But I stand with the Apostle Paul who said in 1 Timothy 6.12 Fight the good fight of faith. We are to earnestly contend for the faith once and for all. Deliver it unto the saints, Jude, verse 3. And Paul didn't have it easy. Once he was stoned at Lystra and left for dead. He was thrown off his ships. Oh, it never ended for him. And when he came to the end, and I only hope I'll be able to say it as he said it in 2 Timothy 4, 6 and 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, but unto all them also who love his appearing. O oh, Rexella, I want to hear my Lord say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, and no price is too great for me to pay. Mm, and I'm sure you're going to hear that, Jack. And as you study this video, I trust that most of the questions on your minds and hearts will be answered. May the Lord bless you as you begin to view it right now. Today, friends, we have some very, very interesting headlines that we would like to share with you. And I maybe answer some questions on your mind about our president, President Obama's religion in question. Are there many beliefs and many paths to heaven? That's a very good question. And Georgetown University hid religious symbols at White House request. Ooh, that's a big one. And we will be discussing all of those things and much, much more today because I know many of these things are on your minds. The religion of President Obama is being questioned by people that it's uh, more than 50-50. More believe that he is not a Christian than believe that he is and may think he might be a Muslim. So we're going to investigate this today. But he got on ABC and other talk programs and said, I am a Christian. Well, we're going to study what a Christian really is. It's not enough to talk the language. Jesus said, this people honest me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, Mark 7, 6. You are they which justify yourselves before men by what you say, but God knows your heart, Luke 16, 15. They profess that they know God, but in works and daily living, they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. And that's Titus 1.16. Oh, Jack, I'm so happy to hear you quote the authority. The authority is not Jack Van Impe or what my opinion is or what your opinion is. The authority of who a Christian really is is the Bible. That's God speaking. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, and they spoke as God told them to write. So it's wonderful. Jack, you're the walking Bible. And because of it, thy word is truth, John 17, 17. All right, we're going to begin with some astounding statements that uh, 
really tell quite a story. We're going to begin with Louis Farrakhan, and he is the leader of the Nation of Islam. And uh, he certainly has quite a statement to say about our president, Jack. Oh, and as a Muslim leader, he says, our Messiah has come. And when you hear him speaking, you are hearing the Messiah. Now, people wonder if he's a Christian when a Muslim leader calls him their Messiah. But this is strong because there's only one Messiah coming and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ because he is God. Great is the mystery of godliness that God was manifest in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16 And this Messiah is coming back on that white horse in Revelation 19 verse 11 as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Verse 16 And then he reigns for 1,000 years. Revelation 20 verse 4 As the God and Messiah over the Jews and the Christians. Oh, Jack, so there is only one Messiah, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. One Messiah. Well, there's a country that agrees with Louis Farrakhan. They would love to have Obama as their leader. Take a look, Pakistani plea. Make Obama supreme Islamic leader. They are ready to open the door to our president as their leader, leader Jack. Leader of Islam. And then again, there are four Muslim nations now that want Obama to come and make the peace between the Jews and the Palestinians. And it happens to be Egypt, uh, Syria, Jordan, and of course Lebanon. And we have Saudi Arabia also pleading for Obama to help them. Now why would Muslims who so despise Christians in many of these lands, and I got a directory this thick of all the Christians who are dying in these lands simply because they love the Word of God and the Bible and proclaim Jesus as the Savior. Why would they want a Christian man to lead their movements? It's strange. Well, you know, I have another person that I'm sure you all recognize. He is a movie director, and that is Spike Lee. He has something quite interesting to say about our president once again. He said, now that we have Obama as the president, we can change the way we uh, rate the dates in history from B.C. to A.D. And A.D. is the Latin for after Christ. B.C. before Christ, after Christ, and says we'll change it to Obama before Obama and after Obama. That is ridiculous and against the Word of God. All right, now we have a picture here of someone you'll recognize, a congressman, Jesse Jackson, Jr. And friends, once again, Jack's going to reveal what he had to say. He said, now that Obama has come to power, we will have to add another chapter to the Bible. No, you won't. For Revelation 22, 16, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches, and you do not add or subtract from my holy book. Verse 18, I testify unto every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add thereto, God shall add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. Don't tamper with God's word, Deuteronomy 4.2. Oh, yes, how important that is, Jack, so important. Well, we all recognize this gentleman, the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. And uh, some thought that this would be an answer to his dream, but his son has something to say, Martin Luther King III. What does he have to say about November 4th? As bright a day as November 4th was in our nation's history, it's important to remember that Barack Obama's election is not a panacea for race relations in this country. Though it carries us further down the path toward equality, Barack Obama's election does not render my father's dream realized. Wow. And uh, perhaps it's because they do feel that the president has let them down, Jack. That's right, Rexella. Uh, a man by the name of Magic Johnson said, our people are not being treated right by this president. And he said, I'm going to Washington to see if I can become one of the czars for the black people. He went. We've not heard another word since. Well, you know, Jack, with everything you've given us already on this program, I think it makes all of us a little bit better acquainted with what some people have said about him. But there are still questions. 
Perhaps about his background, that's in the foreground, Jack. Well, first of all, he had a Muslim father, and he went to a Wahhabite school. Now, what does that mean? There are other denominations within Islam. We have the Sunnis and Shiites, as you know, they've killed one another to the tune of 85,000 in Iraq already and blow up one another's mosques. All mosques built to honor Allah and they blow them up against one another. And then we have the Sufis, the peace-loving Muslims. But there are the Wahhabites and that is Bin Laden's crowd. And they say we must kill even the Sunnis and Shiites because they're not true to the faith. That's the problem within Islam. But I wonder how much of this was embedded in the minds of this young man when he was in the grade schools of the Wahhabites. And then I want to show you his grandparents here on the screen for a moment. They were Baptists and Methodists, and then they turned against the Christian faith and became Unitarians, Universalists. And they don't believe in the Trinity. They don't believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. There are many ways to heaven, and that's exactly what Obama is teaching, as you'll hear in a few minutes from now. And they also said, because everyone is going to be saved, that's the universalist message, we don't believe in a hell. And again, Obama agrees with that doctrine against uh, 219 times this book mentions hell or explains what goes on in that place of doom for all eternity. Obama has had at Ramadan two different years in succession where he had the leaders of Islam there and what a time they had. But on the day of prayer, he wasn't in the crowd. And furthermore, uh, Franklin Graham was to be the leader of the day of prayer and speaker, but the Pentagon said you cannot speak because you were unkind to the Muslims after 9-11. Who wouldn't have been? 3,000 precious people dead and their relatives for the years to come brokenhearted because they missed their loved ones. How sad when the greatest evangelist in history, Dr. Billy Graham, hears the words that his son is canceled at the day of prayer because he made a remark about what these Muslims did in 9-11 and killing all these people. And he said, the Pentagon informs you that you're not allowed to speak. Now, wait a minute. That's a cover-up. Our president is the commander-in-chief, and the Pentagon does nothing without his instruction. So he immediately flew to Billy Graham's home so that people could see, oh, I'm not really part of this. While he was there, Franklin appeared, and he said to the president, see if you can get me reinstated. Oh, we'll, we'll see about it. Later, Franklin called, and he said it was never mentioned. What a disgrace to this family that has meant so much to Christianity in America and the world. Mm, beautifully said, Jack. Well, you know what? I want to present something to you that we can look at and see if you can have the answer to this. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture, actually recognizing the real Jesus. Now, the feet of Jesus went throughout the land over there went into many areas. Did they recognize him as the real savior of the world? Do you recognize him as the real savior of the world? Recognizing Jesus is so important in our day. And that's what this is all about, Jack. Who is Jesus? And our Jesus is being put down, and it's just happened at two Catholic universities. Before you get angry with me, hang on, because Bishop Sheen is going to tell you that this is Catholic prediction, that this would happen in some of their Catholic schools in the country. All right, well, we're going to go on to what Jack was just speaking about, where he was at uh, Georgetown in Notre Dame. This is Notre Dame. Audacity without hope. Our president spoke at Georgetown University. And who was missing? Jesus was missing from Obama's Georgetown speech. He hid religious symbols at White House request when he was there. Here's somebody who uh, talks about a false prophet and a false religion, Bishop Sheen. He was a very famous priest on television. The false prophet will have a religion without a cross, a religion without a world to come, a religion to destroy religions. Satan will recruit him 
from among our bishops. Wow. Whoa, Thank you, Bishop very, Sheen. Very, very strong, isn't it? And you it, saw Jim? it. Notre Dame gives him a doctorate, an honorary degree, and he proclaims abortion against the teaching of the Catholic Church. Then he goes to speak at Georgetown, and the White House calls, and again, oh, if he didn't know anything about it, the White House said, you must cover up the images and signatures of Jesus Christ. That is the greatest shame ever, and Bishop Sheen, you're right. Some of these priests there did it. And my Bible says anyone who does that is an enemy of the cross of Christ. And that is a Philippians 3.18. And you know why they hate the cross so much? Because Christ made peace through the blood of his cross. Colossians 1.20. And 1 Corinthians 1.18 says the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, to them that are lost, foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it's the power of God unto salvation. And Paul said in Galatians six fourteen, God forbid that I should glory in anything except the cross of Christ. Oh, to bring back the old hymns at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I'm happy all the day. I'd love to hear the old rugged cross again, wouldn't you? Where Jesus paid such a price for you and me. People of the world hate the cross and sad that this happened at a Catholic university but was predicted by Bishop Sheen for the latter days just before Christ returns. You know, Jack, the old rugged cross at one time was the number one religious song in the world. Yeah. And now most people don't even know what it is. Oh, they were drowned out on Sunday mornings with their rock bands. Oh, yes. Well, a new survey was released <laughs> on religion and public life. And it, friends, it really astounded me to see how many uh, replicated and did away with what the Bible had to say. Let's look at this, if you will, please. USA Today, many beliefs, many paths to heaven. All right, here we are. America's uncertain about Obama's faith. We're going to be listening to what he had to say. Why questions about Obama's faith background refuse to die? Well, many of the questions that are on your mind, the president did answer very directly to Kathleen Falsani, who is a wonderful journalist for the Chicago Sun-Times. Here is the interview. Oh my, many, many pages. We don't have time to read them all to you, but I've chosen about three or four of the questions that she asked him very, very directly. Number one, what do you believe? And here's his answer. I'm rooted in the Christian tradition. But there are many paths to the same place, heaven. Whew, many paths, Jack. Oh, that's Christian tradition. That's the first I've known about it. I got 400 verses where it says Jesus is the only way and 700 verses that say it's the blood. Any man can say 1,100 times there are many ways to heaven is not a Christian. Neither are you if you teach that like Oprah Winfrey. She's the queen of the New Age movement that teaches there are many ways. And someone said to her in the program one day, what about Jesus? She says, what about Jesus? Now listen to me carefully, friend. This is God's word. I said 1,100 times. Now let me give you a few of them. First of all, Jesus spoke about himself in John 3.36. He said, He that believeth on me has everlasting life. He that believeth not on me shall not see life, but the wrath, wrath, judgment of God shall be upon him. In John 5, verses 39 and 40, Jesus said, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. You have missed it. They are they which talk about me, and you won't come to me that you might have life. John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me has everlasting life. Now get this one, John 8, 24, Jesus said, You die in your sin. If you believe not, I am he. I am the Savior. I am God. If you don't believe it, you die in your sin. Now, no one can misunderstand Jesus in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no man, no man can come unto God the Father but by me. And if you deny these things, you call my Jesus, my God and Savior, a liar and a deceiver. You can't get away with it. But the whole New Testament is... Filled with it, 400 verses about Jesus being the only way. Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven 
given among men whereby we must be saved. No other name, no other name. The Philippian jailer cried out to Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Oh, there are many ways. Uh, we've got a smorgasbord religion. Pick and choose what you want. Hey, Christianity is not a democracy. They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And you know, Obama speaks about the bigoted Paul. Wait a minute. He said, I don't like what he says in Romans. Well, it's God who said it. It's the Holy Spirit who said it. Holy men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, 2 Peter 1.21. So you better take what Paul had to say in Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Romans 6.23, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Our Lord, Romans 10, 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. Again, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, I declare unto you the gospel, the good news. What is that good news? Verses 3 and 4, that Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Galatians 3, 26, you're all the children of God. Isn't that nice? That's universalism. That's not what it says. You're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Colossians 1.20, Christ made peace through the blood of his cross. And then again in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And the living in Christ are going to go up with him. You're not in Christ, you're not going to go up. You won't be in the rapture of the come up hither of Revelation 4, verse 1. Let's go on. The Bible is so plain. Titus 2.13, we're looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Messiah who's coming back. And oh, I love 1 Peter 2.24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. 1 John 5, verses 11 to 13. This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is through God's Son. He that has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life. Not hope so, guess so, think so. No, and it's only through the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've just given maybe 20, 25 verses. There are 1,100 that Jesus and the shed blood is the only way. And if you don't believe that, you are not a Christian. I don't care what your denominational tag is. Whoa. And you may not like me, but woe unto That's you. Right. Jesus said, when all men speak well of you, for so they're their fathers to the false prophets. Whoa, Jack, with everything you had to say about Jesus being the only way and the Savior of the world. The next question that Ms. Falsani asked Obama was, who is Jesus to you? And he said he's a historical figure, a bridge between God and man, and a wonderful teacher, nothing about Savior of the world. Then she said, do you believe in heaven? I don't presume to have knowledge of what happens after I die. And then in USA Today, he also said, I can't accept the idea of hell. I don't respect the bigotry of the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans. So he didn't know about heaven or hell there, Jack. Mr. President, when it's real, you know so. Jesus said in Luke 10, 20, rejoice because your names are written in heaven. First John 3, 14, we know we've passed from death unto life. Not hope so, guess so, think so, know so. And you can't get around it. But about hell, oh, I don't believe in a God who will put people in hell. Well, then you don't believe in my God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the second member of the Trinity, who preached on hell 15 times in Matthew 5:22, 5, 5:29, 5, 5, 5:30, uh, Matthew 10:29, 11:23, 16, verse 18, 18, verse 9. Listen to Jesus in Matthew 23:15. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land, and when you you make him a convert, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourself. Verse 33, you serpents, you bunch of snakes, how shall you escape the damnation of hell? Did you know that Jesus preached that? Jesus also mentioned it in Mark 9, verses 43, 45, 47, and in Luke 
chapter 10, verse 15, 12, verse 5, and 16, 23, where he said, The rich man died and was buried, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and said, Father Abraham, have mercy, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. If you don't believe what Jesus said, about hell, again, you're calling him a liar and a deceiver, and nobody who does that can be a Christian. Oh, Dick, so well put from the Word of God. And I would ask you the same question that Ms. Balsani asked our president. Who is Jesus to you? What do you think about Jesus? Do you believe that he's the Savior of the world? Do you believe that he can forgive all of your sins? Do you believe that you need him? alone to get into heaven that he's the only way do you believe him when he said i am the way oh jack i trust that today this message that you've given to us will mean so much to all of us to accept christ as our savior you didn't like what i said today remember romans 3 4 let god be true and every man a liar believe god there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun May I just say that some of the things we're going to be talking about today, I have never seen Jack Penipi so concerned about and so much in prayer about and so wanting to relate what the Bible says to you concerning these headlines. One, is America watchful enough of lurking threats? Very good question. And then the persecution of Christians around the world. And the Egyptian president warns of global terrorism if the Mideast peace talks fail. A very, very good insight there also. And because uh, the program today, as I mentioned, is one that's on Jack's heart, he spent so many hours gathering headlines from around the world, as also our CEO, Ken Vance, helps us. Every single day is on that internet getting the headlines from around the world. And Jack, I've never seen you more burdened. I've been doing a lot of studying Rexella, and I've read about 15 different volumes now in Islam. And I've read the Quran through. I was talking to an Egyptian, and I know what they teach, but I just was trying to find out how he felt about this. I said, what do you folks in Islam think about Jesus. Oh, he's one of our prophets. Doesn't that sound wonderful? That would make you embrace and say, oh, we're one and the same. But what does that mean? You know, when anyone speaks against Muhammad, there's a death threat like Salman Rushdie experienced. But they could say anything about our Jesus and we never speak up. You are going to be shocked when you hear what Islam teaches about Jesus. When their Mahdi comes, Jesus comes with them. There's a growing concern about Islamic extremists. Islamic extremists. Here you see Tony Blair takes on the world. The former Prime Minister argues the West has become too imbued or infiltrated with doubt and lacking emission. What is that? On repairing the economy, combating Islamic extremism, and restoring purpose. Going on with Time Magazine, is America Islamophobic? Well, we'll deal with that too. Again, is America watchful enough of lurking threats? They're out there. Islam in America, it's part of the fabric of life, but protests reveal a growing hostility to the religion. A Muslim. Time Magazine. Yes, and here's something. Senator Joseph Lieberman, a group of self-identified extremist Muslims, has definitely declared war on us, a war which they justify by reference to their religion. Again, from Time Magazine, the growing influence of Islam. Islam isn't in America to be equal to any other faith, but to become dominant. The Quran should be the highest authority in America, and Islam the only accepted religion on earth. That is their quote. And that was Once. from a conference in San Jose, California. All right, thank you, Jack. Failed times, square bomber gets life sentence. 
And from the Oakland Press, Pontiac, Michigan, fake bomb left near Wrigley prompts Chicago arrest. Hadn't even heard about that one. Oh my, this moves my heart a little boy, the lure of Al-Qaeda, one boy's journey into bin Laden's terror network. They start training This is now the young. rest of the world. Al-Qaeda in Africa. And then going on here, Al-Qaeda creating an army in Yemen. Africa, Yemen. Let's look again. Pakistan, Al-Qaeda in Pakistan is U.S. most formidable threat. And bombings kill seven in capital of Nigeria. Do you notice how many countries I've already mentioned there? Here's again radical Islam on the rise in the Balkans. And Islamists hit Central Asia in new strikes. Now, you know, we cannot classify all Muslims into one group, the terrorist groups. Jack has given us several groups of Muslims, different denominations, if you will, of the Muslims. There are peace-loving Muslims. We've met them and we appreciate them. Uh, Jack, uh, maybe you'd like to mention who they are once again. Well, you have the Sufis, and a man met me at the Crowers and said, you know, my Ayman talks about your program and encourages us to watch it because we are peace-loving Muslims, the Sufis. Then you have the Wahhabites on the other end, and that is Bin Laden, and this comes out of Egypt, and they are the warriors. They want everyone killed because they are the only ones true to Islam. And I'm sorry to say, but even our president went to grade school and was taught the Wahhabite doctrine. I hope he doesn't revert in the future to accepting what they do teach. But the Wahhabites say, let's kill all the Sunnis and Shiites, the other two groups, because they're not true to the faith. And so you've got them fighting one another. And Rex Elliott, what yes. really bugs me, bothers me is, how can you get these people to kill one another to the tune of 85,000 deaths? And then the Shiite mosque is to Allah, and the Sunni mosque is to Allah, but they blow up one another's mosques to the same God. It doesn't make sense. That's like a Baptist blowing up all the Lutheran churches or vice versa. It doesn't make sense, Rexella. No. Well, I tell you, friends, we are not in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, to perform war there. We're there to try and make peace between the Sunnis and the Shiites who are blowing up each other's mosques. And that is our goal. But there's great concern among politicians and among ministers like Jack Van Impey uh, because there is a worldwide threat as far as terrorism is concerned. Like Tony Blair, Jack. Yes, and I like what you read from the lips of Senator Lieberman. And he said, our president says we are not at war with Islam, nor will we ever be. That is wrong, my friend. He said, we are at war. I wonder what our president thinks is going on presently in Iraq and Afghanistan and soon in Iran and maybe Pakistan. And that's dangerous because when these men, terrorists, get a hold of the atomic weaponry of Pakistan, this old world will be in real trouble. All hell will be let loose. But anyway, we are living in terrible times. And 2 Timothy 3, verse 1 says, This and also the last day, perilous, dangerous time shall come. It's arrived. Jesus said in Luke 21, 25, There will come a time when nations will be in distress with perplexity and mass confusion. Men's hearts will fail them for fear, for looking after those things which shall come to pass on the earth, for the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. That's verse 26. But I've got news for you if you're a born-again Christian. We are not going to be here because we are going to be evacuated through what is called the rapture, the snatching up. When Christ says, come up hither, Revelation 4, verse 1, and we sweep through the heavenlies in the twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians 15, 52. And as I've said so often, that's 187 trillion billions of miles, and we make it in 11 one-hundredths of a second. We're not going to be here for all of this. That's why we can be comforted with 1 Peter 3, 14, be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Why? The rapture is coming. 
Watch you therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape. Escape all these things that shall come to pass on the earth. And the escape is found in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain in Christ shall be caught up together with them, with the dead, in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort, comfort one another with these words. Some people say, oh, it scares me to hear about the coming of Jesus. Listen to me. Revelation 22, 4 is one of the greatest things ever. What happens when he comes? We shall see his face. Oh, that's not very good, is it? Hey, it's so wonderful that we're told in Titus 2.13 we're to be looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to see him soon. Oh, Jack, what a great blessing that is. And you know, people sometimes say, oh, some of those headlines scare me. Don't be scared. It's pointing to the coming of the Lord. How wonderful to look up and know that he's coming very, very soon. Now, Friends, uh, as we've been uh, putting this together today for you, Jack gave me some headlines that shocked me. There have been massive waves of violence against Christians worldwide. They're not only killing each other, but Christians. And we'll see why in just a moment. Let's take a look at this. The cry of the persecution of Christians around the world, around the world. Okay, let's see how many countries. World Net Daily rewards offered for murdering Christians, destroying homes and churches. India, going once again, Pakistan, Islam, or else Christians in Pakistan face uh, violence from militant Islam. And again, the sheer scale of anti-Christian violence. Friend, there are four countries named in that article. Egypt's persecuted Christians' violence against Coptics is on the rise and all but ignored by the state. Of course, the Coptics are the Christians in Egypt. And British aid workers shot dead in Afghanistan for preaching Christianity. Oh, my, oh, my. And then pastor shot killed on way home from worship. Now, that's in Somalia. Three more churches, Catholic school attacked in Malaysia. Notice all these different countries, Malaysian churches, firebombed as Alarao escalates. And the horrific and mysterious death of Bishop Pardovisi, and that is in Turkey. Once again, some of Hamas, a gripping account of terror, betrayal, political intrigue, and unthinkable choices. The son of Hamas, the leader in Palestine. Yes, Jack. Hamas, Christian convert. I've left a society that sanctifies terror. Now, this young man's name is Masab, and he is the son of Hamas leader. And he's saying, oh my, I know that I'm endangering my life, but I know Jesus Christ is my Savior. How wonderful. You know, I have to admire him because he's losing his family. They're all turning their back on him. But he's praying for their salvation also. I've never experienced anything like that. I was reared in a Christian home right here in the United States. But should we be concerned about Christianity here in the States, Jack? We really should, Rexella. And you know, my heart's heavy. And... Ezekiel 3.17 says, I've made you a watchman. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give America and the world warning from me. Again, in Ezekiel 33.3, blow the trumpet and warn my people and old Paul with a broken heart in his days in Acts 20.31. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And I feel that way now. Why should we be concerned? Well, first of all, in 1993, we had two automobiles planted at the Twin Towers that blew up a lot of the buildings. And then, of course, 9-11 occurred, where 3,000 of our people died when 19 Arab terrorists manned the planes and commanded the pilots to smash them into the Twin Towers, and many were cremated. And now we're saying, oh well, oh well, let's all get together, let's pray at 
ground zero isn't right. One step further, we had the shoe bomber, and then we had the bomber who had the dynamite in his underwear, and both failed. Then we had Fort Hood, when Major Hassan runs in with two 38s and mows down 13 of our GIs and wounds another 30 and says, it's Allah who Akbar, great is Allah, greatest is this God Allah. And now they're having him on trial say they don't know if they can find enough evidence. What are we, stupid? Man, they were lying all over the floor. Everyone saw him do it. We've got the evidence. He ought to be hanged because the Bible says he that kills a man shall surely be put to death. Leviticus 24, 17. I'm tired of these liberals, these crybabies that say, oh, uh, this is wrong. It's against the word of God. No, it is the word of God. You just misinterpreted it. The word of God. Let's go one step further. Then we had this guy just a few months ago in New York that planted his car in the midst of it. He's been sentenced to life in prison, but he says, we are getting ready with many others, and America, you'll pay for it. The warnings are there. We're hearing everything. And there were eight men who were going to try to blow up the subways of New York City. And as I said once before, New York's going to get more and more of it because it has millions of Jews living there. And this is Al-Qaeda's goal, the Taliban's goal, Iran's goal, get rid of the Jews. Now, I believe we're going to be gone through the rapture very soon. We may not experience any of it, but if we do, I love Philippians 1.29. Unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on Jesus but also to suffer for his sake. 2 Timothy 3 verses 12 and 13. Yea, and all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecutions. And if you're not living godly, you don't have to worry about it. And that's where most of the church stands today. We're not sold out to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the word of God teaches that there'll be persecution for the cross of Christ, Galatians 6, 12. But Matthew 12, 31 says, there are going to be many who will not go for it. They'll fall by the way. They're not real Christians. They only have it in their head. The enemy with their lips, their heart is far from me, Mark 7, 6. And they're going to flee. And they'll say, I want nothing to do with Christianity anymore. And that's 1 John 2, 19. They went out from us, but they weren't of us. If they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out to prove they were not really of us. They went forward at some church and they had an exercise rather than an experience with God. They became unconverted converts and America's full of that kind of Christianity right now. And they're the compromisers, believe me. But one more thing I want to say. Islam's a religion of love? No, Christianity is. Jesus said, By this shall all men know you're my disciples, because you have love one for another. John 13, 35. It was Jesus who many times said, Love your neighbors yourself. One instance, Matthew 19, verse 19. And while this is terrific stuff, all this killing of Christians, all this killing of one another, Muslim against Muslim, blowing up one another's mosque, as we said, something's wrong. Let's see what this book has to say about a God who loves, loves all. 1 John 4, 8, God is love. And listen to him in 1 John 3, 10. In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loves not his brother. 1 John 3, 14, we know we've passed from death unto life. What's the proof? We love the brothers and sisters in the faith. Verse 15, whosoever hates his brother is a murderer. And no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. But under Islam, if you are a suicide bomber and millions die as through hundreds of suicide bombers, you get 72 versions of peace for all eternity. That's very confusing, isn't it? First John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God. What do you say? He that loveth not, knoweth not God. Verse 20, If a man say, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. Ouch! The Holy Spirit wrote that. But oh, I love First John three sixteen. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because 
God laid down his life for us, Rexella, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters in Christ. How different from the Sunnis and the Shiites. Terrorism is around the world, but it's focused on a very small little country called Israel. And you know, this is nothing new, friends, nothing new. Take a look. There is Hitler. We all know of his hatred for Israel. Again, Ahmadinejad, Israel's savage dog unleashed in region. And Iranian vice president termed Zionist regime devil's proxy on earth. Lebanon prime minister, Obama is ideal person to lead Mideast talks. Abbas to Obama imposed Mideast peace solution. And going on, the battle for Jerusalem. Do you see where the terrorism is? Israel's Netanyahu, no concession on East Jerusalem. Jordanian king, world will pay price if direct Mideast talks fail. And Egypt president warns of global terror if Mideast peace talks fail. Perez warns of nuclear Mid-East. Nuclear Mid-East. Oh, Jack, we know where it's centered. Now, are we going to have a huge battle in Israel? Hitler killed six million Jews. Ahmadinejad says, before my Messiah Mahdi can come, we have to kill most of the Jews. What a loving Messiah they must have to get rid of all the Jews of the world like Hitler wanted to do. Now, there's a peace thing going on right now. Isn't it strange that four of the Muslim nations, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, along with the Palestinians, all say we want Obama to be the one who makes the peace pact, and that's how the world dictator comes to power. It comes in peaceably, Daniel 11:21. He enters in peaceably, Daniel 11.24. He makes a seven-year contract, Daniel 9.27. But it only lasts for 42 months, and then all hell breaks loose. For when they say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. And the war begins. Why? Because they divided Jerusalem, Joel 3.2, the exact thing. Our president is promising to the Palestinians, we will give you Jerusalem. Hey, Jerusalem belongs to the Jews 930 times in God's holy word. And I'll tell you, you're in dangerous trouble when you start giving Jerusalem to someone else when it belongs to Israel. Then it's going to fail. And because of it, the war begins over Jerusalem, as I've already said. And Russia makes the first move, Ezekiel 38, 39. It's the war of the latter years and the latter days, 38, verses 8 and 16. And Russia makes the move. Why? Because the peace was made. Russia says, I'm going against them that are at race. I'm going against them that are at peace. Ezekiel 38, verse 11. That's the first invasion. Armageddon is a three-pronged invasion of Israel. First it's Russia, then it's China. And that's Revelation 16, 12 and chapter 9, verses 14 to 18. And isn't it strange that the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization has put Russia and China together as friends to fight and war together? And it's exactly what this book has said for 2,500 years. And then thirdly, all nations come against Jerusalem, Zechariah 14, 2. Messiah appears, his feet hit the Mount of Olives, verse 4, and he declares the peace. He puts down those are uh, creating war and killing one another, Revelation 11, 18, and then they beat their swords in the plowshares and their spears into printing with Isaiah 2, 4. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, and get us out of this mess. Jack, I think that this is probably one of the most uh, important programs, and it's been a real burden on your heart to really do it today. Because my Jesus is being dishonored, and I'm going to stand for the Christ I love. Yes, well, we want to exalt the, the Christ of the Bible. That's who he is. You know, Jack quotes the Bible all the time, and I appreciate it so much, Jack. He's memorized over 15,000 verses, and that's why we can take his word if he quotes the Bible. Everybody has an opinion, but Jack quotes the Bible. Now, it's very difficult for me to understand extremists in any religion, but especially when it controls the minds of people to the point that if you disagree with them, you're going to pay the price. You're going to pay the price. Now here is a, a well-known person that I do want to quote, Pierre Thomas. And he gave some very interesting thoughts here. In the last 18 months, 40 American citizens have been charged in international terrorism cases. It runs the gamut 
Many are recent immigrants. Some are black, some are white. They are mostly men, but there have been cases involving women. What disturbs the FBI is that with little prodding, these suspects are willing to help Islamic radicals and in some cases murder their fellow citizens. The FBI is concerned there is a pool of people ready to be radicalized. And, of course, this was taken from an interview with the lovely Diane Sawyer. Now, someone going on who wants to take advantage of the pool of people is this person, Al-Qaeda message aimed at the region. Now, talking about the region is Detroit. But he wants jihadist attacks in the United States, not, and not only Detroit, but going over to Europe, Paris, London. And he would like for Americans to contribute and be the one attacking all right, let's go on here. More terror threats against Europe are possible. That's talking about Paris. Poll says 10% of Germans want a new Fuhrer. To control them. To control them. And then here, this is what I said right up front, Moss increasingly not welcome in Europe. And we've witnessed a great deal of anti-immigrant sentiment in history, but it was not a global phenomenon to the extent that it is today. Oh, and going on here, here is a well-known journalist, Charles Krothheimer. And Jack, would you please like to read this for us? He's talking about radical Islam. Oh, and he's concerned because our president won't call them Islamic terrorists. What do the Fort Hood shooter, the Christmas Day bomber, and the Times Square attacker all have in common? Asked Charles Krothheimer. All were inspired by radical Islamists ideology. In fact, all the major terrorist attacks in this century, from 9-11 to Mumbai to London to Madrid to Bali, were perpetrated by jihadists. Yet to this day, the Obama administration cannot bring itself to utter that simple truth, having banned from its official vocabulary and terms jihadist, Islamist, and Islamic terrorism. Thank all you, right. Dr. Crothammer. Ooh, that is really, really quite an article there. Whose offense? Now, this is an article by Jane Cheney. Why aren't radical Christians as dedicated to our beliefs as radical Muslims are to theirs? We are. But radical Christianity is, to say the least, different. Culturally, we are called to appeal and persuade, not threaten and coerce. Our message is believe in Christ, not believe in Christ or else. Our job description is to make disciples, not break dissenters. And when we are persecuted, the Lord says, vengeance is mine. Wow. Oh, yes, Jack. I'd say wow to that, too. That is a wonderful, wonderful statement. In the light of everything we're talking about today, friends, is it necessary to defend the way that Christ is predicted in the Bible and is presented in the Bible, our faith, should we defend it, but in a scriptural way, Jack? Absolutely, Rex Allen. Listen to me. I'm not only talking about the prophet Jesus of Islam, but I'm talking about men like Bishop Spung, an Episcopalian leader who travels America and Canada running Christ into the ground. God help these men in within Christendom who've become apostates of the Christian faith in all our denominations already. Why? Jesus said in Matthew 24, verses 5, 11, and 24, that there shall be false Christs and false prophets. And the prophet Jesus of Islam is one of those false prophets, as you're going to see just a little later. 2 Peter 2, 1 says, There were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately, secretly, shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord Jesus that bought them. In Jude, verse 3, it says, We are to earnestly contend for the faith once and for all, delivered to the saints, for there are men crept in secretly, ungodly men who are trying to turn the grace of God and our Lord Jesus Christ into lasciviousness, a filthy, rotten message. That's within Christendom as well as Islam. I'm going to be fair, but... We are to fight the good fight of faith, Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, 12. And we do it with the word of God. Why? Because John 17, verse 17 says, Thy word is truth. And when you use the truth of God's word under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, 
it really hits hard. That's why Jeremiah 23, 29 says, Is not my word like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? And Hebrews 4, 12 says, The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. That's how the Romans won the battle with a two-edged sword. They could use it in every direction. And the power of this book brings Holy Spirit conviction. Now, Paul used it. And when he came to the end of the way, he said in 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, ha, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not only to me, but to all them who love his appearing, his second coming. Amen. Ooh, you know, Jack, I love it when you quote the scriptures. The scriptures so complete about our Lord. Not only is history, B.C., A.D., centered around our Lord, but the Bible makes it very clear who he was, why he came, and he's coming again. And uh, certainly our Lord Jesus of the Old Testament, the Messiah, was presented in the New Testament. Let's take a look. Scriptures, Messiah, the Old Testament, the New Testament, our Savior, the doctrine of Machtism, the doctrine of Machtism. We're going to be discussing that in a moment. Comrades in arms in Iran, and there are two who agree on what they want to accomplish. And here we see something, I referred to this before, Jesus the warrior, but the way that Christians think of Jesus coming back, he's coming to stop Armageddon, anything bad on the earth. But that's not the way that the Muslims view Jesus the warrior. We're going to talk about that in a moment, and Jack will make it very, very clear what the scriptures have to say about our wonderful Lord. Very plain, right, Jack? Oh, this precious book. Listen to me carefully now, my friends. They call him their prophet in Islam, but he is God Almighty, the second member of the Trinity, according to the word that the Holy Spirit put together through men of old, Second Peter 1.21. God, yes, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us, Matthew 123. Again, the Philippians yeller cries out to Paul and Silas in Acts 16, verse 30, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, verse 34. And they believed in God, Jesus, with all their house. Romans 9, 5, Christ came who is over all God, blessed forever. 1 Timothy 3, 16, great is the mystery of God. And said, God was manifest in the flesh. No, oh, do I love this, Rex Heller. Hebrews 1, 8. The father is speaking and he's talking to his son. And he says, thy throne, O oh God, is forever and ever. If the father calls his son God, maybe some of you out there who don't better change some of your theology because the father believes that his son was God with him from all eternity. Micah 5, verse 2. Now, there's something very interesting here. Long before Jesus came, the Trinity sat down and planned that Jesus would become the Savior. And that's why uh, Isaiah 43, 11 says, I even, I am the Lord, and there is no other Savior beside me. And then father sent his son. And he became the savior of the world, 1 John 4, 14. But you know, in God's plan, Christ as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world before he came, it was planned in eternity. And that's why in the Old Testament, there is a virgin birth, Isaiah 7, 14. There is a crucifixion, Psalm twenty-two sixteen. 16. There is a resurrection, Psalm 16, verses 10 and others. It's so plain you can't miss it. Yes, he's the Savior. Even the Virgin Mary, when she looked at that little babe that day in that cradle, said in Luke 147, My spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Even she called Jesus her Savior. And we are looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's go one step further. He's coming back as the king. Yahweh, who is God the Father, says in Psalm 2, verse 6, I'll set my king Jesus upon the holy hill of Zion, the holy hill of Jerusalem. That's where he's going to rule. And that's why it's going to be called the city of the great king. Matthew 5, verse 35. 
and it's pictured in Revelation 19 as he comes regally, royally, majestically on that white horse as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, verse 16. But Rexella, this is where the Muslims are going to go wrong because he is not going to be subordinate to Muhammad or to Allah or anyone else because Philippians 2 verses 10 and 11 says, At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the Jesus. Now, let me talk about the Jesus of Islam. Oh, this bothers me. I've studied 15 volumes on this. He comes back with Mukti, the one that Ahmadinejad is promoting. And Ahmadinejad of Iran says, I can't get Mukti to return until I kill most of the Jews. What a loving person Mukti must be. But when he comes, he has a chief lieutenant backing him, and his name is the Prophet Jesus. Let me go slowly. First of all, this Jesus apologizes to the world for having started Christianity. For while he was gone, he became a Muslim. And now he is the evangelist for Islam in the world, along with Mukti. And he says, you must turn to Allah. That's his message to all the world. I was wrong. He's right. But get this. If they do not convert, it is the job of Jesus to put to death Jews and Christians. God, God forgive them. Mm. You know, I have something that I'd like for you to see on the screen right now. Everything that Jack says that they believe about Jesus is written for us. And we're not going to take time to read it all. But in the number two there, he will be a faithful Muslim. Oh my, oh my, oh my. No, let's go on. I want you to see number five. He'll destroy Christianity. Are you kidding? He established Christianity. He is Christianity. Oh, just so many, many things whereby what they believe and we do not believe and how he's going to get married and have children and so forth when he comes back. Let me just say this to you, friends, that that is not the Christ of the Bible. That's not the Lord that we worship at all. It's just the opposite. When Jesus comes back, he's going to establish peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The fulfillment of the Lord's Prayer. Oh, Jack, it's pretty hard for us to go uh, to ground zero and pray with uh, those who do not accept Jesus as we do. It's well, a different prayer. Christians who don't know anything about the Bible, and I'm telling you, that's 50% of us nowadays, say, oh, is that great that we can all work together because after all, they love our Jesus too. No, they don't. You just heard what I've told you, and I've studied it, and I can back it. I can document every word I've said. But let's go one step further. Should I go to ground zero and pray with people who talk about my Jesus that way? Absolutely not. Amos 3.3, 3, can two walk together except they be agreed? 1 Corinthians 15.33, evil communications and connections destroy character. But there's more to it. We have a command from Jesus that we cannot run with unbelievers. 2 Corinthians 6, 14, 18, Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? What agreement hath the temple of God, Christians' bodies, with the temple of idols? Wherefore, wherefore, come out from among them and be you separate, saith the Lord. And I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord God Almighty. Now, Romans 16, verse 17. You're still not satisfied? Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine of Christ, which you received, and avoid them. Second John, verses 9 to 11. Get it? Whosoever abides not in the doctrine of Christ has not God the Father. He that abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If there comes any unto you and brings not this doctrine about Christ, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. Don't you dare say God bless you to them. For he that bids him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. 
And verse 8 says, look to yourselves that you lose not your rewards because you ran with a crowd that goes against Jesus Christ and against the Father of Heaven, Yahweh. And then we're to go to ground zero and pray together to two different gods when the first commandment is thou shalt have no other gods before me. Exodus chapter 20 verse 3. Oh no, listen to me. You can't even talk about 9-11 now. Billy Graham's son is canceled for the day of prayer because he said a word against it. And it was the Pentagon who said, you can't come here and pray. But the Muslims in USA Today said we were instrumental in getting him canceled. The day of prayer. And O'Reilly's on the program the other night with the Barbara Walters special, The View. And he talks about 9-11 and two of her renegades walk out. When they come back, they won't sit near him. Praise God for you, Mr. O'Reilly. Keep saying it. Because you, as a great Catholic, are all standing on the word of God. And these people, Barbara Walters, should take up this video and answer it from God's word instead of the knowledge they don't have. Oh, how powerful the Word of God is. And it's good that we can say to those that disagree with us, believe in Christ. But we don't say believe in Christ or else, like some others do. Now, have you heard of the United Nations? Woo, very important resolution on defamation of religion. Well, a Dutch politician is already in trouble about this. And you must take a look at Mr. Wilders. Now, he could get a year in jail. He's a 47-year-old conservative lawmaker over there in Holland. Hate speech trial starts in the Netherlands. Only because he said something about the Quran. All right. And here we are again in Holland. Free speech on trial. An elected member of the Dutch parliament faces prison for anti-Muslim thought crime. And here you see a well-known journalist, that is Juan Williams, and he was fired from National Public Radio, and that restarts the Muslim debate going on. National Public Radio fires analyst Juan Williams after comments made on the Fox News. And then, of course, wrongly fired analysts based on his honest feelings. Well, here is something. Of course, it is our president and something that he had to say about everything that's going on. Free speech. Jack, would you like to read this, please? On October 1, 2009, the Obama administration, in conjunction with the Egyptian government, introduced an anti-free speech measure to the United Nations Human Rights Council. It was adopted the next day without a vote. They just did it. Little evidence suggests that Americans on either side of the aisle contemplated the U.S. entering the ring and supporting the opposition's anti-freedom measures. Yet now the current administration has done worse. It's leading the charge. God forgive you, President Obama. The context and references of the resolutions make them almost certain to apply only or disproportionately to Islam. It'll favor them, not Christianity. All right, somebody is very much against. She denounces the proposed defamation of religious policies, and of course that is Hillary Clinton, U.S. Secretary of State. Hillary Clinton has voiced strong opposition to proposed United Nations resolutions on defamation of religion, saying that such policies would restrict free speech. The protection of speech about religion and religious discourse is important in a world where many different faith beliefs, said Clinton. Now, going on here, Leonard A. Leo, chairman of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, last week testified to members of Congress that the only religion and religious adherents that are specifically mentioned in the defamation resolutions this year's and past years are Islam and Muslims. Whoa, now here you have two opinions, our presidents and of course the Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and they are very much in opposite positions on the defamation of religious rights there, Jack. In other words, she says we need to have the freedom to say what's on our heart. Oh, Rexel, if this thing happens in Holland and they send this politician to prison for one year simply because he said something against Islam and they fire a black brother off of one of the major radio stations of America because he said, I get afraid when I see them coming on board in their garb. And by the way, uh, 
burqa has been banned in France and all Europe's going to ban it because they say they could be carrying ammunition, bombs inside of the vestments. And, oh, they're marching. But what is forgotten is that Syria, a Muslim nation, has just ordered the same thing because they're afraid of what might happen to them by the opposite denomination within Islam. Rexella, so much could happen soon. We're in the last days. And it says, unto you it's given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. That's the word of God, yes. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are they you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, rejoice, be exceeding glad. Why? Greatest reward in heaven. Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. Revelation 2.10, oh, Christian, only God knows what's going to happen here soon if this inundates the world through the United Nations and maybe our president pushing for it. God forgive this man. God forgive him. Friends, as you have viewed this video, I trust that many of the questions upon your minds and hearts have been answered. Jack certainly uses the Word of God, doesn't he? And that's what we can depend upon always. You know, everybody, I said this so often, has an opinion, but God has the answers. And I want to thank Jack for searching the Word of God to enlighten our minds and hearts. And Jack, you have some additional things you'd like to add. I would, Rexella, because as I've said in this video already, it was one of our programs, and we only have 22 minutes uh, to give out material. There are times we can't get it all into a program. And since I completed this, I was reading a book the other day by one of my Christian brothers. In fact, I've promoted his books in the past, and I was very upset by what he said. He tried to minimize the prophet Jesus of Islam with our Christ by saying, oh, we both believe many of the same things about him. Oh, really? What? Well, first of all, the Muslims believe he was born of a virgin. That doesn't mean anything. Now, I appreciate the precious Virgin Mary and how the Holy Spirit came upon her and she bore the child through an act of God who placed the child in her without the instrumentality of a man. It was a holy experience. However, it doesn't mean a thing if he's virgin born if he's not God. That's the point. And they will not accept Christ as God. And that's why Matthew 1.23 says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Get it? Which being interpreted is God with us. And then I read how my brother said, And they also believe in the resurrection. So what? All the pagan religions believe that all of their people are going to be resurrected. And the resurrection is only important if you believe that Christ is God and that the resurrection proved he was God. Romans 1.4 Christ is declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Holy Spirit by the resurrection of the dead. Both the virgin birth and his resurrection says he's God. If he's not God like our Muslim friends teach, then it's meaningless to say, oh, we both believe in the virgin birth and the resurrection. Doesn't mean a thing. But he's God. Christ came who is over all God. Blessed forever for Romans 9.5. Great is the mystery of godliness that God was manifest in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16. We have believed in Christ. This is the true God and eternal life, 1 John 5.20. But Rexella, they also go as far as to say, we don't believe he died on the cross. And I've discovered that a lot of the garbage that the Da Vinci Code has published has come from this kind of a background. Same teaching about his marriage and having babies and all the rest. Islam teaches that too, that he's going to when he reigns with Mukti, the Messiah of the Shiites. Now, they say he didn't die on a cross. It was a rigged situation. 
And somebody that looked like Jesus died on the cross, and three days later, he's walking around. Hey, resurrection. Well, if that's what your resurrection is, it doesn't mean much, does it? Oh, we could just say so much. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Amos 3.3, 3. no. And that's why Romans 16, 17 says, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you received about Christ. Avoid them. Avoid them. Avoid them. Enough said? Mm, my, oh my, Jack, the word of God is very, very clear. And if you have been convinced, perhaps you have not opened your heart to the Lord previously uh, to watching this video, I trust that you will right now. Accept Christ as your Savior. He came into the world for you. In fact, if you'd been the only one on earth, He would have come because He loves you. He loved me. And He died for every single individual. I trust that you will open your heart right now. And you know, Jack, I say this every week. Will you pray the prayer so that we know how to be prepared and how to be ready for the coming of the Lord? You say, Jack, is it a simple thing to be saved? Yes. Romans 10, 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. No other way. And I'm going to take time, because I have more time right now, to pray this prayer with you. Look at me. Say these words after me. Lord Jesus, God from all eternity, you so loved all of us, Jesus, including me, that you came, took a body containing blood to die and cleanse me through that blood. For your word says, without shedding of blood, is no remission of sins. And Peter could say, Oh, we're redeemed, saved by the precious blood of Jesus. So right now, I'm asking you to do this. Pray it. Lord Jesus, come into my heart today. Cleanse me. Wash me. Save me from all my past sins. Right now, be my Savior for now and for all eternity. Come into my heart, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Oh my, if you have never received Christ, I trust that you did pray that prayer. Congratulations if you did. I'll never forget the day that I prayed that prayer. I was a teenager. My life was changed. Perhaps there are some things in your life and you say, you know, Rexella, I, I did open my heart to the Lord before Jack prayed that prayer, but I haven't been living for him. And you know, Jack, I think it would be a good thing if you were to ask those people who've sort of gone away from oh. Christ to come back to him. We need to be living for Christ every day Rick, today. Rexella, the thing that breaks my heart, and I've been in this work for 63 years, is to see the people who one time said, oh, I love Jesus, and today they're out into every type of sin there is. And they still think they're going to go to heaven. You can't live that way and meet God at the end of the road. So I'm asking you, who say you have prayed that prayer and received Jesus, but you, you've drifted away to pray this prayer. Lord, my heart has become cold toward you, Jesus. My life has become very wicked. I've lived in sin. I've walked away from you. I've done many things of which I'm ashamed. And I want to renounce those sins right now because your word says, if I confess my sins, you'll forgive me. I want a new start today, Lord. Your return could happen at any minute. Oh, I want to be ready. Lord Jesus, take me back now. In your holy name I pray this. Amen. Amen. You know, it's wonderful to know that when the Lord forgives, He forgets. He doesn't remember what we've done. How great it is to know that your record is clean in heaven and you can begin serving Him with all of your heart. I trust that you will. 
And if you made that decision, please write to me. I want to say, again, I'll send you First Steps in a New Direction. There is my address. Please write to us. Let us know that you've made that decision to accept Christ or to come back to Him. I trust that you did. Congratulations. God bless you. I want to leave you with this very, very good thought as you walk with Him every day. Daily prayers are the best remedy for daily cares. We all have cares. How good to know the door is always open, the heart of God. God bless you, and we look forward to being in your home again next week. And until then, I always say, remember, God does care for you, and so do we. So very much. Bye-bye.